So adult cell leukemia lymphoma is perhaps the first cancer in the blood that was linked to a virus. It was it was uh, it was Dr. Gallo in the NIH when it was actually even before HIV was discovered as a virus producing a disease. HCLB1 actually was named type one because it was the first retrovirus linked to produce cancer, uh, and specifically hematologic cancer. So due to cell leukemia lymphoma uh, is a disease that is unfortunately lethal. Uh, we call it deadly lymphoma as well, in which patients that are diagnosed, they usually don't live longer than four to 10 months, which is the average. Um, this disease uh, is basically divided in, in four subtypes. And I'm not gonna go that in detail, but all I can say is, it's called adult cell leukemia lymphoma or ATLL because it either can present as a leukemia, meaning just purely in the blood, or as a lymphoma, meaning just like tumors in the neck or any other place that can produce symptoms like pain and things like that. Um, why is it important for me to research this uh, disease? The first one is because it's caused by a virus. And you know, you know what a virus can make. Just remember about the pandemic, something that no one wants to remember but we, we knew that virus can produce this. So no one was surprised that a virus produced such a detrimental uh, a public health issue, but not only that, also to the economy of the country. I mean, the many countries shut down, many countries did a lot of things to trying to prevent this from spreading because it was compromising not only the, the, the population's health, but also the economy of the countries. So that's one of the things, this is, this is caused by a virus that is, and this virus, gets into the into the human genome of the patients and it produces a lot of issues within that um uh, the human DNA that then leads into this cancer. So that was one of the, my my first interest. The second interest is that many as I uh, I was mentioning previously, we run this big study of 873 patients with ATLL. And what we find out is that the disease is aggressive regardless in which geographic area you live. Even if you live in such a developed country like the United States or Japan, or in such an undeveloped country or developing country such as Peru or Chile or Ecuador, uh, it doesn't matter where you live in the world, that disease will kill you very fast, despite of you receiving transplant, despite of you receiving the, the most advanced care you have. So the second thing about my interest about this disease is that it's a lethal disease for which there are novel treatments that needs to be developed uh, and needs to be performed. Um, so, so because of that, and because the rarity of the disease, we see around, I would say, optimistically 10 to 15 cases uh, of this disease in the United States. And we're talking about millions, uh, millions of people living in the United States. So that talks about the rarity of the disease. And most importantly is that most of the time I, I get asked about how to manage these patients because not many people have seen and because I have the privilege to work with this patient population. So back in 2020, when I started my faculty position, I had a very uh, beloved patient who unfortunately died despite having received chemotherapy in a first line, chemotherapy in a second line, uh, having received CAR T cells, two different CAR T cells. Okay, so we're talking about technologies that are not available anywhere else, two different CAR T cells and other investigational agents. She received almost five lines of therapy. Uh, she was in her 50s and never made it to transplant because that disease continued to progress. So uh, her daughter lived through that. Uh, and then talking to her and talking about how that, uh, on the other caveat, I guess, to this is that when I was talking to her daughter, uh, I asked the first question I asked her when I met her was, were you tested for this virus? And she clearly said, ne no one ever told me I need to be tested for the virus. So my next thing for her was, well, you must be tested for the virus. And that's a common practice in Peru, where we see HGLB1. That's a common practice, actually, surprisingly, in London, in the UK, where you actually have a program for these patients because they treat many of these patients. Or France. France has, because they have... Um, um, uh, islands, or, or I would say part of the, the of the countries, uh, there's French speaking islands in the Caribbean. Many of these patients that live in the Caribbean where the virus is endemic, they travel to France to get the care. So they're familiar with that disease and they know family needs to be tested for the virus. 
So when I asked her, have you been tested for the virus? She was shocked that she could potentially follow the same path. Unfortunately, her mouth has followed. She is not tested and she doesn't know that she has the virus. So then that raised the concern for her uh, of, I mean, why are we not creating awareness, which is my main, my was my concern too. So that's when the, the this ATL support group started. So it all came based on a case that I saw in the hospital, despite having done it multiple times and seeing multiple of these patients and then start developing this group. Ever since then, we have 50 plus members. Again, to be a rare disease, we have to be uh, mindful that 50, maybe for a Facebook group, and it's not that much. But if I tell you that our 10 cases per year in the United States, 50 probably is exaggerating maybe uh, five years already of research and then the group has been only uh, in life for, for a year. So that is, speaks about, and, and there's been a lot of questions, like the question I was asking you, people ask there, I've been diagnosed with this, what are the next steps? I mean, we've been able to send out clinical trials for, that could be a good fit for them because for rare diseases, clinical trials is always is gonna be one of the best options aside from the standard of care. Uh, we have been able to provide educational material, both in English and Spanish. Um, and we have been able also to provide care to their families, uh, telling them be tested for the virus, and if you're positive for the virus, have someone in your family, in your, uh, in your care, your health care, to look at for any signs or symptoms, because this is a blood disorder. So many times the first symptoms comes out in the blood. There is no specific screening that can predict when the disease can happen. But if you have at least someone to monitor, make sure that there is no nodes or there is no blood involvement because the malignant cells can be seen in the blood. Uh, and it could be a regular uh, blood count, doesn't necessarily have to be a flow cytometry compared to mycosis fungoides, for instance, that you need to have a flow cytometry, except that you have other kind of cutaneous lymphoma that it could be clearly seen in, in the smear in the microscope. Um, so all those things have been uh, been able to be possible due to the drive of a family member trying to understand these rare diseases. So our group is open and we are receiving members every I would say probably maybe one every one or two weeks, uh, but it's been active and they share their experiences as well as what the treatment has been. And the most important thing is that the members are not only from the US, we actually have members from everywhere that have been able to see this. Uh, so, so any uh, uh, advertisement for this group will be greatly appreciated since we think we can help people and given some guidance about what is available in the world, because again, uh, options are very limited even in the United States.